So I will first start by uh, giving an overview of management principles of multi-ligament knee injury. And if the moderators then allow, I'll quickly present one or two cases to highlight these principles. Uh, so when it comes to multi-ligament injuries of the knees, I like to classify them using a simple classification uh, known as the uh, KD classification or the Schenck classification. So single cruciate intact knee dislocations, that is a PCL intact knee with a torn ACL and PLC, these have low risk of neurovascular injuries. Then you have the KD2. KD2 is a bicruciate injury with intact uh, collaterals. This is a relatively rare injury. And then a bicruciate with one collateral. These can be further classified as KD3M in which the medial side is gone or a KD3L in which there is a lateral side injury. Medial sided injuries are far more common than lateral sided injuries. Rarely, you also get all four ligaments torn as a consequence of a very high energy injury. Fracture dislocations again are classified similarly depending on the number of the ligaments torn. ACL and PCL evulsions are excluded. They are classified as ligament disruption. In some special circumstances, the term C, alphabet C, denotes vascular injury and N denotes neural injury. Now, the initial management uh, when the patient comes to you in an emergency situation obviously depends upon the estimation of vascularity. And the best way to do that is serial estimation of pedal pulses. Because it is known that non-flow limiting intimal tears, they do not progress to, uh, to full occlusion. So there is no need to use the ankle brachial pressure index because it requires special equipment. And it's unreliable in elderly people, in diabetics, and in hypertensive. And the cutoff line of ABPI is also controversial. The role of angiography is quite selective. It's based purely on clinical judgment. Just like in a fracture scenario, it is important to understand the personality of the injury. And the best way to do that is through a thorough clinical assessment. And uh, the important things to look for in inspection are ecchymosis and dimples. Ecchymosis sometimes can be the only indicator of a PCL or a medial collateral injury. And a dimple can sometimes indicate an irreducible dislocation. I like to do a simple Lachman for ACL, a posterior drawer for PCL. On the medial side, I like to look at valgus stability at 20 to 30 degrees and at full extension. On the lateral side, similarly, varus stability at 30 and assessment of external rotation at 30 and 60 degrees for the popliteus. It is important to look at the lateral popliteal nerve by checking for the strength of foot eversion, ankle dorsiflexion and toe extension, and also to look at the autonomous zone of the common peroneal nerve for sensation. When it comes to imaging, both the X-ray and the MRI are required. It is, of course, useful in such circumstances to always remember medial sided anatomy and uh, the excellent anatomical works of Dr. Rob Laprad and his group are useful references in this regard. So I always have these charts in my theater so that I can be reminded intraoperatively of what I'm actually dealing with because these structures don't look that clean when you operate upon them. It is again useful to have a good idea of the radiological anatomy, especially if you want to use a CM intraoperatively, or maybe in a post-op scenario where you want to assess how well you have done the surgery by looking at the tunnels. Similarly, you can see the lateral structures on imaging, both on the X-ray, and you can use the same knowledge to assess your lateral side tunnels on imaging. And it is uh, important to know the anatomy of the fibular head. You don't need so many, uh, you don't need to remember so many attachments. If you just manage to remember the attachment of the fibular collateral ligament and the popliteal ligament, that should be more than enough. It is very useful for lateral reconstructions. The current evidence overwhelmingly favors surgery for managing multi-ligament injuries. Immediate surgery is advocated for irreducible dislocations or if there is any vascular injury or if it's a compound or an open dislocation. Early surgery is advised for avulsion fractures or KD5 injuries uh, or if uh, some kind of a delay has been imposed due to a plastic surgery or a vascular procedure or if the patient is obese or if otherwise the soft tissue condition is not considered to be good. Now, when it comes to surgeries, there are multiple controversies and I'll just try to address them one by one. Splinting the knee dislocation of the multi-ligament injured patient is best done with a small posterior pad kept beneath the calf, the upper calf, so that the tibia can be translated anteriorly to maintain the normal tibiofemoral step off. A more expensive way of doing this and perhaps a better way of doing this is to use a dynamic PCL brace and if time permits, I'll present a case which demonstrates the successful use of this brace. 
plaster cast is uh, no longer in vogue the use of external fixator may be considered when the injury is open or if there is a vascular injury and if the knee is very unstable for just for initial fixation now when it comes to surgery open surgery is recommended for collaterals and corners and uh, arthroscopic surgery is recommended for cruciates and sometimes it is useful to remember that even the cruciates can be handled by open surgery which again i'll try to show through some case examples the timing of surgery early surgery is better now when it comes to kd2 the time is 2 to 3 weeks kd3 injuries again 2 to 3 weeks in some instances between 3 to 6 weeks as per these published guidelines a uh, graft we have a shortage of graft as was previously addressed by dr deepak joshi and one graft which can be considered in this scenario is the peroneus longus it's a good robust graft and it can be used specially to reconstruct the pcl if you want to use the hamstrings for the medial side uh in case all four are gone i first like to tension the pcl then the acl then the lateral side and then the medial side the rehab goes in a very slow manner i like to splint them in extension for four weeks uh, non weight bearing for six weeks a prone range of motion the only exception is if i have given a dynamic pcl brace then i would like to allow a supine range of motion otherwise it's a prone range of motion i advise my patients to use the brace for at least 6 months roughly in a year and it is always advisable to let them do a co contraction of quadriceps and hamstrings to prevent shear stresses across the repair strengthening exercises after 6 months and return to sports roughly at the end of a year so to summarize uh, the things to look for are pulse a uh, routine clinical palpation and angiography on selective grounds for diagnosis it's mainly or your clinical assessment intraop stress x-rays are something which can be used and uh, surgery is the preferred uh, method of handling them early on you try to repair collaterals and reconstruct cruciates uh, with an open mind as well uh, you you can do these structures very well in an open uh, uh, surgery as well thank you very much indeed 